Welcome back to My Time to Fly. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to get back in the airplane and do one of the things I enjoy most. That is, I got to take somebody up for their first time in a small airplane. The night before the flight, I did a lot of thinking, as I always do. Who am I taking up? Who is this person? What is their understanding? What might their goals be in aviation? And how should I approach the flight? This time, it happened to be a colleague of mine and a friend uh, who I know has an incredible mechanical mind and would really enjoy digging into some of the details of flying. So in the video, I hope you see that I took that, that understanding, and really tried to teach as much as I can. Aside from helping him understand what was happening and giving him some comfort, I really firmly believe that teaching others the knowledge you have helps you learn to the next level, really to a level that you can't imagine. The best part in this case, if the person doesn't really know what an airplane is all about, they're not gonna tell you when you're wrong. I'm sure as I review the video, I'll find lots of things that I could have said better, more elegantly, or maybe I flat out said wrong or did wrong, <laughs> but he didn't correct me. So it's a great way to learn and uh, maybe even impress people along the way. So thanks for joining. I know the video is a little long. Feel free to look down below in the timeline. There's plenty of places you can click to get to the next phase of the flight. I'll try and detail that, those out as best that I can. As always, thanks for being a part of the community. Uh, if you're not, consider subscribing, hit that like button, and uh, check out some of my other content. I appreciate you being here, and uh, let's get to the flying. See y'all later. Here. They're two different sizes, so you can't get it wrong. No, oh, other side. And then um, put it underneath that yoke. That just will um, keep them out of the way. All right, so we'll get some lights on. White Cloud traffic, RV 10 south for left bound wind runway 18, White Cloud. Set the altimeter, we're 760, 775 right here. This is our GPS, this is what we'll use to navigate today. Here we'll check the wind. If the wind was really going one way or the other, we would, um, we would go that way, but because we, we're going to take off, we're going to head east, we'll, uh, we'll go down to the end of this runway and take off into the east, right into the sun. It's a pretty bumpy ride on the ground, uh, just because of the way this, uh, because of the way this uh, uh, suspension is, it's pretty bumpy. So what we do uh, is we'll go down to the end of the runway, and there's a little, I guess, uh, I don't know what to call it, a pullover place down there. It's a run-up area. We'll go down there and uh, run this thing up. So we'll kind of put it, put it through its paces, the engine through its paces on the ground, make sure everything looks good, and then then we'll go. It's uh, we do it every time. Can you hear in those all right? You won't be able to talk very well unless you put the microphone pretty close to your face. All right. There's also uh, noise. There's uh, volume adjustments on your ears up here. So if one ear is louder than the other, you can adjust them. Or if you need them both louder, I keep the intercom in here, which is right here, uh, really loud, because the camera picks it up better then. Yeah, I was just talking to Delta Lima, sorry. Got it, Dave. Okay, so we're, today we're going to go to RNP. So I'm going to punch that in here. We're going to Owasso Community, direct. I'll explain how that works in a minute, once we're up and flying. And I'll 
put it in here too. White Cloud traffic, Skyline 214 Romeo Delta is uh, two miles south, entering a left down 118. All that traffic you hear is not just here, it's all over the place. So, like when we go to Owasso, there CTAF, which is what you hear, is 123.0. So we'll get that switched over to 123.0. We can click over to them when we need to. So again, in a run-up, we're going to check all the control surfaces, make every, make sure everything's doing what it's supposed to do, and then we're going to run the engine through its paces. Um, and in this plane, the propeller has adjustable pitch, so we're going to run that through its paces. Um, just make sure that everything's working fine. So first, we make sure that we have clear controls, make sure everything goes up and down where it's supposed to, the rudder works. Uh, we know our fuel quantities. I said we're going to start on the left. We'll switch to the right. We're making good fuel pressure. Uh, the altimeter's set. We'll set the heading indicator on roll-on because uh, the compass doesn't work right now. We're going to go up to about 1,200 RPMs, maybe 1,300. We should see this amp gauge start to move. This plane has a, a generator in it instead of an alternator, so it needs RPMs to make power. And make sure the gear indicator works. It does. It's a little finicky. We're going to set elevator trim to take off. This gauge right here. We're going to put two. Well, we'll put that in a minute. All right. Now we're going to take it up to 1700. This has a. All planes really have a two magneto ish uh, system. They have two spark plugs per cylinder. So we make sure that each of those independently is working by shutting the other one off. So if I go to the left mag only, it, it'll drop RPMs because it's only running off one spark plug. And then same thing for the other mag. They should be about equal, which these are within 10 RPMs. All right, then we pull our carb heat. That pumps hot air into the carburetor to uh, stop uh, icing issues that happen. So that worked, I, I heard an RPM drop. And we take it up to about 1,900 RPMs, and we're going to exercise the propeller. This uses oil pressure to adjust the pitch of the propeller right here. So you'll hear the, hear the propeller slow down and saw the RPMs drop. We do it three times. On the second one, we're looking for a little manifold pressure rise. So there's the rise. And on the third one, I'm looking for, just the, I'm looking for the oil pressure to just move a little bit. See it move? Yeah. And we go all the way back in. Then what I like to do is pull the carb heat again, drop this thing down to idle, like I'm landing. That's about the configuration it would be in when we're landing. Make sure that it still runs. Kind of important. Okay. The next thing we do is we make sure that this gr this area right here is clear. I've had it happen once where it wasn't, and it's really hard to get the wheels up because this bar, I'm going to pull down and push down into here. That's what picks the wheels up. Okay, so we just make sure that area is clear. If you would actually take your seat and slide it up till it locks into the first, you don't have to even pull the bar. You'll just hear it lock in to the first. It goes quite a way. There you go. I just do that so it doesn't move. All right, so we'll get the fuel pump and uh, mixture on roll on as soon as we go onto the runway. Kind of the goal here is we're going to let this thing accelerate on the ground until it gets to about 65 miles an hour, maybe even a tick more than that. When that happens, it's going to start to want to fly. I'll just give it a little bit of back pressure, and it'll take off. We'll stay pretty flat for a second or two, uh, and I'll get the wheels up, and we'll let the plane accelerate, and then we'll climb out. Okay, we're going to climb out at about 100 between 100 and 110 miles an hour initially, and then probably about 120. We're only going to climb up to 3,500 feet today. There's no, no point in going real high. We're only 68 miles away from where we're going. Uh, there's really, I'm not telling you this to scare, this to scare you. Uh, I'm just, well, shouldn't have been out. Oh. Um, I'm telling you this because it's just important you know. There's two key decision points as we're taking off. I tell this to all my passengers. If we're below 500 feet above the ground, which in this case is about 1,200 feet, if we're below 1,200 feet, I'm going to point it straight, and something happens, say it quits, I'm going to point it straight ahead and find somewhere to put it, okay? If we're above 1,200 feet, 
I'm going to consider turning around. I might not, but I'm going to consider turning around for a second. If we're above 1,000 feet above the ground, I'll turn around and come back to the airport. Today there's no wind, which is a little helpful. If there was a lot of wind pushing us, well, actually, it kind of hurts us today. If there was a lot of wind pushing us this way, it's a lot easier to turn around and make it back, okay? So you just have to be prepared. If you're not prepared, you'll fail if, if something happens, okay? I don't anticipate it, but you just need to know. All right, so we're going to make sure the area is clear. I haven't heard any radio calls, but we'll also use our eyes, make sure no one's on final coming down the runway. We're going to just go out to the runway and point it down it and put the screws to it and away we'll go. Sparta traffic, Moody 6708 uniforms, departing 7, Sparta. Okay, we'll get our mixture in, electric fuel pump on, two pumps of flaps in. Richard? This runway is pretty interesting because it's got a big dip in it. Uh, it's kind of hard when you're landing. It's not so bad on, on uh, takeoff. All right, ready? Yeah, we're already doing uh, 55. It's nice and cold today, so it really wants to go. There's 60. Okay, we're just going to barely get it off the ground. This is that flat period. Let it accelerate. Get the gear up. Climb out. About 95. There's 100. We use this wheel right here as our elevator trim. That's what we use to control the pitch of the airplane. There's 400 feet above the ground already. We're climbing at about 800 feet a minute. Marshall traffic 572 Romeo Juliet. We're going to pull these flaps out of it. That'll let the plane accelerate. It'll kill this fuel pump. Now we'll climb out at about 120. And uh, we're going to pull the power back just a little bit to 25 inches of manifold pressure. That's how we measure power. and then 2,500 RPMs. Just that easy. Now we're going to say we're going to go direct to Owasso. It's putting me on a track of 104, which is 104. Uh, then I'm going to turn until, this says right now I'm doing a track of 80. So I'm going to turn further east until that track lines up with the desired track. It's about like that, right into the damn sun. Try and use the cockpit to, or the top of this thing to shade me a little bit. Another hour it wouldn't have been a big deal. It'll be. As we go higher, you'll see that the manifold pressure will start to just drop naturally. That's what happens. As you know, as you go higher, um, there's thinner air, right? So you can't make as much vacuum. It's really a vacuum gauge is all it is. And then because we plugged this in and, and started using it, now I show up on here. That's me or us. And we can kind of track ourselves and make sure that we don't run into any airspace that we don't want to. I'm just slowly climbing up. There's there's no reason to be in a hurry to climb. Marshall traffic 572 Romeo Juliet final runway 10 Marshall. Maple Grove traffic 97 Echo base to final 27 Maple Grove. Pretty smooth, right? Nothing crazy about it. What we will do is, uh, once we get up to about 3,500, we'll push this thing over, get some speed, and uh, close the cowl flaps. And 
then I'll let you fly it. This mixture knob is really critical uh, right here. Yep. It, that same concept that, you know, the air gets thinner the higher you go. Well, you have to compensate for it, right? Be like running a, you know, a dirt bike or a car or whatever at 10,000 feet. You couldn't run it with the same jets that you have. Yep. Right? You'd have to you'd have to change the jets. Well, that's essentially what we're doing here. We're always adjusting the air fuel mixture, um, and I do it pretty quickly. Like some people wait till they get up to their desired altitude to do it. Um, I do it as I climb, and we use this gauge right here, exhaust gas temperature, to monitor that fi uh, air fuel mixture. There's 3,000 feet. The ground level here is about 700 or 800 feet, so we're about 2,200 above the ground right now. We'll climb up to 3,500, which might sound a little odd, but uh, that cruising altitudes are in 500 increments when you're visual, when you're VFR. When you're IFR, uh, when you're on an instrument flight plan, they're at even numbers. So if you're going between north and south, if you're going east, you know, generally going east, you fly an odd number plus 500, and if you're going west, you fly an even number uh, plus 500. So we'll, when we go back home, we'll fly at, uh, maybe I'll just fly at 3,000, because that's kind of a common altitude, but because uh, there's no reason to climb up to 4,500, but you could. There's 3,500, so we'll push this nose over. We'll bring this back to 24 inches. 2400 RPMs, that'll quiet it down a little bit. Lakeview traffic 38 final for 28 Lakeview. Continue to lean. Got a little downwind there, Ben. Close our cowl flaps. Those are flaps that open up below the engine compartment and let air uh, let air escape, really create more of a vacuum through the uh, through the engine compartment because this thing's all air cooled. So does this twist the prop, or does it act? Yep, it actually, uh, there's a prop governor. So this, this changes, it doesn't actually twist the prop. This changes how much oil pressure is going to the prop. Oh, okay. And that makes the prop maintain a constant, uh, a constant pitch, uh, a constant RPM. Zero, turning left base to final, one zero, Lakeview. I'm going to switch this over to 123 zero, because that's where we're going, or that's the, their radio where we're going. So this course, I'm doing a horrible job staying on course, but this th course um, translates over to this uh, gauge right here, and this line should be considered the line that we want to be on. If we started to drift way off the, like say we started to drift south, this line, which is our course, would actually go left and say, hey buddy, you gotta go left to get back on that course. There's a million ways to see where, where we are and where we're going. This also shows other airplanes that are around us. All of these are different airplanes that are around us. Does it tell you their altitudes and stuff? Yep. Yep. So like this is a, a I don't know, Delta flight or something. So it's 19,600 feet above us. Not much to worry about. This 9993 Whiskey, that's a little bit more concerning. He, that shows that he's really at our same altitude. So we'll keep our eyes peeled for him. So we measure airspeed in a lot of different ways in an airplane because there's a lot of factors that go into it. Right now, our indicated airspeed is just shy of 160 miles an hour. That's that's where the needle actually points on the gauge. Now, the higher you are, and the, as the temperature changes, so the density as the density of the air changes, that's less and less accurate. And you have to adjust for it. And then, of course, there's always uh, wind, right? So that's how fast we're moving through the body of air. That doesn't say how fast the body of air is moving over the ground. Right, so if we look here, this is our actual ground speed, how fast we're moving across the ground, 131 knots, which is 
pretty darn close to what we're at, moving through the air. There's almost no wind up here. So we're doing about 150 miles an hour across the ground. So really the plane, once you trim it up, get it where it's, you know, flying decent, it flies itself. I fly it with, a, with the pedals more than anything. And the pedals just move the rudder, you know, ever so slightly. So if you move the rudder, it puts a little bit of yaw in and, and it ends up banking over. And so I'm turning to the right real slightly right now. You can see that needle starting to deviate. So we're getting a little bit off track. And the closer you get, the more sensitive it is. At 9993, whiskey's below us now. 400 feet off our wing somewhere. It all looks pretty boring from up here, doesn't it? Not much, uh, there's not much elevation change in lower Michigan. You gotta get quite a ways north to start seeing elevation change. See that, uh, see that layer right there? There's a layer of clouds, like a, a sharp lined layer of clouds. Yep. But then see below it, see the haze, the fog. We gotta be careful with that. That's another nice thing that this thing does, is it can give me real time weather. So this is weather where we're going. So at 8.35 it said the wind was 110 at 5 knots, unlimited visibility with a clear sky. So it gives me a little confidence that we're, we'll be all right. Okay, so where we're going has one paved runway and two grass runways. We'll land on the paved runway. Its uh, directions are 11, so 110 degrees and 2-9, 290 degrees. The weather said it was 110 at, or one, yeah, 110 at 5, so we'll, run, we'll land on runway 11. Pattern uh, to the south. Oh. Or left traffic. I always tell my uh, passengers that these gauges are theirs. Like, you gotta watch them. You gotta make sure that we stay in the green. So inevitably, we always get back from the fir uh, first flight. Like, I took my niece and nephews, so I told them that. We always get back and say, yeah, how many times did you look at those gauges? Oh, never. <laughs> you can tell how hard it is to, to stay focused on them. A lot of people invest, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into a plane or uh, even something like this, they'll they'll spend 10 or 20 grand and put an autopilot in it, an autopilot for. Thing flies itself, you know? You just like sit there and play with the pedals a little bit. And now if you were in a, if it was a little rougher out, like it, we've hit a couple little bumps, but really nothing to speak of. Uh, if it was a little rougher, then it might be nice, but. We measure, uh, you know, distance or visibility in, in miles, typically. And it's nice in Michigan because most everything is in mile blocks, right? So it's pretty easy to say, oh yeah, I, I can see out, like right now it gets hazy, but I can see out eight miles or something, you know, whatever. Uh, it's kind of convenient. You get into some of the other states, it's not so easy. So what we're gonna do, you can see that we're, we're almost, you know, we're right here, and runway 11 is right here. So I haven't heard any traffic. We could land straight in. That's something you can do is just kind of go straight in. But normally we fly a traffic pattern, which is, is what I'm going to do in this case uh, because I'm not familiar with the airport. So I want to get a look at it first. I want to be able to, to see it and and know what I'm getting into. So what we'll do is we get closer, we'll deviate right, and we'll make a loop, and we'll fly over like midfield or the end of the field. Then we'll turn in and make a square and come in and land. That way I can see the airport, I know what I'm getting into, I can check the wind sock. Uh, just gives me a little bit of confidence that, you know, I, I can see what's gonna happen. And we have a lot of visual markers when we're flying, so like, when you're beam the end of the runway, that's when you uh, that's when you really pull chop power and start going down to the ground and put flaps in. And then when you're 45 degrees out from it, you make a base turn. There's just a lot of routine that comes into play. Uh, that if I was going straight in, I wouldn't I wouldn't have my timing down at all.
I will say, just just in general, landing is the most difficult part of flying. And for passengers who aren't familiar with what's going on, if they're like in complete oblivion, like if you have no idea what's going on, it's nothing. But because you're intelligent enough where you're going to feel things and hear things, and um, it's a nerve-wracking point. I mean, you're hurling something towards the ground that wants to be in the air. You're essentially chopping the power on something. Uh, it can be, and you're low to the ground, so mistakes mistakes are amplified. Altitude gives you security. Um, mistakes get amplified when you're close to the ground. So the worst thing that can happen, I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. The worst thing that really can happen, or happens a lot, kills. it's what kills most general aviators that die in plane crashes, is they get too slow when they're turning in the traffic pattern. So you think about it, you know, we're in like a state of equilibrium right now, right? Uh, there's just enough lift to keep us up, to keep the weight up, right? There's just enough thrust to make us go 155 miles an hour through the air. Well, when I turn, I have to take some of that lift that's keeping us in the air and use it for the airplane to turn, right? Uh, that's really what you're doing when you turn is you create more, like say I'm making a left turn, I create more lift on that side and less lift on this side. Well. That means that this phenomena of the wing stalling, not having enough air to stay up in, in the air, not having enough airflow, happens at a slower speed. Because you're using that lift to turn instead of keeping you up. Or it happens at a faster speed. So with, we're dead straight, this thing might stall at 60 miles an hour. If I'm in a 60 degree, degree turn, it could stall at 80 miles an hour. And if I stall like this, it just spins and goes right in the ground, right? That's not a good thing. So we, I started, I watch a lot of YouTube, of course, you know, YouTube, aviation YouTube. Um, there's this new concept of a, it's not new, the airlines have used it forever, but it's this the minimum speed at which you're going to maintain in the traffic pattern. So on final, I want to be at 80. Before final, I don't want to be below 90, 95. Okay, if I start getting slow like that, they push the nose towards the ground, keep the speed up, put a little power in it. So. Just know I'm real conscious of it. It's not something I'm, you know. I'll get real quiet when we start getting clo when we start landing because I'm focusing on airspeed and where I am in the traffic pattern. How does it work with like storage? Like, do you just leave it outside while yeah. it's there? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully, it looks like a nice airport. So hopefully they've got some tie downs place you can pull up and just there's hooks and you just pull a rope through it or I got uh, ratchet straps if we need them you just lightly tie it down today no big deal there's not much wind it's not going anywhere set the parking brake you're, you know be done with it so we're gonna make left traffic for runway 11 and I'm gonna flip this back to map and this to documents and put in a landing checklist so we're eight minutes away, nine minutes right now. Pattern altitude is 1,800 feet. We all try and equalize and stay in the same altitude. That way you can see everybody. So we're gonna we're gonna make the pattern at 1,800 feet. So we're at 3,500 right now, 3,600. So uh, so we got to lose 2,000 feet, and we've got eight minutes to do it. So. If we just started a descent right now at 200 feet a minute or so, then that'll get us to the altitude we want to be when we're when we're there. And I've started deviating to the right just a little bit now. So this shows how fast or slow we're climbing or descending. It's a little slow to react, so you got you can't like you, you, know, you can't make a bunch of fast changes to right. It just uses change in pressure versus the static pressure to tell you how fast you're descending. A real common practice is just to kill a little power. Then the nose will just kind of fall over on itself. It's probably the smoothest way to start descending. Beautiful morning for flying, man. It doesn't get much better than this, really. Plus, we were going west and the sun wasn't in our eyes. That makes it really nice. Can you see the airport yet? No. Actually, I do see it now. Do you? 
It's just past the city. That's your hint. You won't actually be able to see the runway. You just have to know what an airport cutout looks like. Does that make sense? Okay, see this see this kind of the opening here and then it turns into all trees. Yep. And then there's the next opening, that's the airport. Long and narrow. All traffic drumming five four eight two Lima. Right hand pattern for runway one eight how? So our runway is going this way. Okay. Right? Yeah, no, maybe not. Yeah, our runway is going this way. So we're going to cross over it like this, turn, and come back in. I'm pretty sure that's the airport. So carburetors have an interesting phenomenon that happens when you start to pull power. If it's humid out or if there's a lot of water in the air, uh, they have this phenomenon where they'll ice. So that's why we have this carb heat. It just redirects some hot air exhaust air to the carburetor. You make less power when you do that because you're putting hot air into the carb. But the other side of that equation is making no power when it quits. Uh, so we tend to lean towards making less power. We're not in a situation where we need to make a bunch of power right now. So. All right. Mixture is as rich as I'm going to put it. Fuel selector, we're staying on the left tank like I said we would. We'll put the electric fuel pump on. Car heat's on. We'll put the landing gear down when we get to 120 miles an hour and then start getting flaps in it. At some point there. We go to a higher RPM setting because Higher RPMs allow you to climb better. So if we get into a situation where we need to climb out of this thing, we're, we're already preset for high RPMs. We got another 400 feet to kill. We really got to start slowing this thing down. That's the biggest problem with this plane. Pro I say problem. It, it does not like to slow down. Actually, a lot of the newer models, Moonies, have uh, these things that come up on top of the wings, air speed brakes. There's 1,900, 100 feet to pattern altitude. And we're starting to get slowed down. We're down to 135. At 120, we'll put the gear down, and that'll really slow us down. So you see the, the runway we're going to land on, there's a couple grass strips, too, where we'll stay on the pavement. But we're going to turn downwind, and then base, and final. And I'm probably going to shut my mouth here in a minute. Just going to get pulled up a little bit. Bleed some of this speed off. There's 120. Get our wheels down. Down and locked. Now we got to get down to 100 miles an hour. We'll get two pumps of flaps in. These flaps make the wing make a lot more uh, lift. Which makes us be able to fly slower. That's really all we're doing. Owasso traffic, money 6708 uniforms, base 11 Owasso. That's the kind of communication we have. He tells me he sees me. There's our third pump of flaps. We'll put the fourth one in on final. We're doing 95. We'll get it slowed down once we get on final.
Make sure final's clear that way. Owasso traffic, Mooney 6708 uniforms, final 1-1 one, one, Owasso. Oh, beautiful runway, look at that. Gorgeous. Owasso traffic, 170, turning left, downwind, 1-1 one, one, Owasso. Now we do, our, it's called Gumps Check. Gas. Make sure that we're on our fullest tank. Undercarriage down and locked. Mixtures in. Props full. That's what we want. That means we're when we land, we'll actually make it. We're going to start getting it slowed down here. It's 85. All I'm going to do is fly it down to the runway and then kind of level off and let the plane do the rest. We just get it close to the runway, pull the power, let the plane land itself. Owasso 1-7-0, base 1-1-1, Owasso. Owasso traffic, Mooney 6708, uniform's going to taxi the end, I'll get off quick, uh, Owasso. Oh, you got plenty of time. Went a little long. I would have liked to make that turn off, but I didn't. It happens.